Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined by co-host Terry Robinson. And today we are going to bring you another episode of Tomes of Magic. Now, I have heard some rumors circulating on the internet that Terry and I are just got into podcasting for the money, and I can tell you that is not true, mainly because there is no money in podcasting. But really, we do this podcast because we have a genuine concern for humanity. And when I think of a genuine concern for humanity, I think of the syndicate. And that's who we're talking about today. But before we get into the syndicate... I'm going to open it up for announcements. I have an announcement uh, myself. Last episode we recorded was the uh, Progenitor's Revised Convention book, and uh, we did that in the evening. The very next morning, I myself was rushed to a hospital and saw a whole lot of doctors and nurses. So the whole time I was thinking, well, that's funny. Doctors kept coming to me saying, "Um, we ran all these tests. Uh, There's something really wrong with you, but we just don't know what it is. And I said, yeah, I, I get that a lot, actually. So the whole time I I was trying to suppress a smile thinking of the Progenitor's Convention book. And and no, there's no connection, really. It's just coincidental. And of course, as a mage fan, that just makes me smile bigger. But anyways, that's enough for me. Terry, do you have any announcements? Yeah, um, I'm glad they were able to retrieve the G10 that had been stuck up your nose. So that's good. (laughs) Um, But (laughs) that is me attempting to make light of uh, what what I imagine the moment was quite harrowing. But... um, also, if you're at PAX Unplugged this weekend and I see you, hello. Also, if you're at PAX Unplugged this weekend and I don't see you, I'm sorry I missed you. And that's pretty well everything for me. Well, we are uh, rolling into the conven- revised convention book series. This is the four books right at the tail end of revised edition. Uh, we're looking at uh, convention book syndicate revised. This came out in 2013, and they dared to buck the trend of a strict 100-page count. They, this clocks in at only 98 pages. They just decided, hey, you know what? We're the syndicate. We can do whatever we want. Downsizing. To. There are five authors working on this book, so it was a, a collaboration between a lot of uh, sharp minds. I think we're ready to start off a walkthrough of this book. Terry, what do you think? I'm ready. And I don't know about you, but in the prologue, the only word I saw was syndicate trinary computer, and everything else kind of blurred. The opening shows what I presume to be a a member of Disbursements who is visiting a research facility somewhere in Japan. And as I was going through, I couldn't help but be like, Adam probably has heard of several of these places, or can verify that the author just made them up. Person from Disbursements goes to a particular facility and is talking to a doctor, and then realizes that the doctor who is trying to get money for vital research is merely a cover for some progenitor operation that is occurring. And you get the amazing line of, the doctor is gifted. Maybe one day we'll even be enlightened. But curing cancer every time, all the time, mortals can't do that. And she blows the lid off of this operation that is consuming far too much money for the devious purpose of curing human cancer. And we just get to see kind of how a member of the syndicate cruises through the world. There is tense spreadsheet action. That's all I needed. I saw a reference to a primary deck and to a spreadsheet, so I was quite happy with uh, easily top five prologue fiction of all of Mage. (laughs) But that is is my biases. Adam, did you have any thoughts about the opening? Yeah, the prologue establishes the idea that the syndicate is keeping the rest of the technocracy in line by not doing things that stretch believability too much and cause paradox. That worked for me. I, I, you know, that, that was fine. Uh, in fact, rather interesting. But what didn't work for me is uh, this idea that, oh, if we cure cancer, that's going to cause paradox because no one's going to believe that. And I, you know, even in 2013, when this book came out, I just flat out disagree with that. For many years, there has been a lot of research on cancer. There has been a lot of articles in newspapers, magazines, etc. people saying, hey, we're going to cure cancer. We just got to figure out this and that. Uh, this thing is coming. I think if someone announced, hey, there's a cure for cancer, I don't think it would cause paradox. I think a lot of people would say, finally, you know, a little, um, I, I kind of disagree with their their particular choice on what stretches believability, but yeah, you know, I, I guess I can get behind the idea of keeping the rest of the technocracy in line from, you know, stretching out paradox. And the introduction kind of goes on to explain more about this with the idea that the syndicate fights for the status quo. And here, status and quo, uh, that is capitalized. It's a set of things that the 
masses want that can be provided. It sets up a a very direct confrontation with the NWO. It's like, ah, there's a civil war brewing. How about that? Which takes something that has been somewhat quiet in the previous books and makes it much louder. They bring up that the dimensional anomaly is still a mystery at this point. It feels like they should have been able to piece that together, but... I understand that it's one of those things that while we're reading through, we are omniscient readers that gets the developer perspective, but in world things are are likely quite more mysterious. We find out that the theme is keepers of the status quo and the mood is bear amongst bulls that uh, my interpretation of that latter figure of speech is a bull is generally viewed as somebody who believes that the market is going to improve and a bear is someone who thinks it's going to, to get worse, uh, We have the phrase bull and bear markets when discussing exchanges and so on. And kind of that it is their job to keep the other groups in the technocracy grounded. My interpretation of the idea of consensus is not that they are making so much a guess as what mortals will do, but that they've done enough preliminary testing that they're pretty sure when something goes from small scale to big scale, it may run into problems. Uh, Any thoughts on the introduction? One of the things that actually, I got to admit, it kind of bothered me about the uh, introduction was on page 12. It says, quote, one of the most hated factions in all of consensual reality. Expect your opinions of this vast convention to change, end quote. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) Not only did did this book have constant examples of how bad the syndicate really is, but just two pages later, we have the header, Chapter 1, Status Me, and an illustration, like a full-page illustration of a smug, old, fat, white guy who feels like he just uh, you know, swallowed the canary, so to speak. It's like, okay, look, if you're trying to change my opinion about hating this convention, this is not working out too well. I, mean, I, I just kind of wonder, I mean, was, was that line in the introduction, I mean, was it honest or was it just cynical? Well, uh, I, I think they were I expecting know. you to go from hating the syndicate to really hating the syndicate. So that, to me, <laughs> qualifies as a change. But yeah, that guy is, <laughs> he is the syndicate. That plus the 10 of patterns, the uh, tarot card at the beginning, that to me is you're like, uh-huh, yep, that's that's the asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, but uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on the intro. Uh, tell me about chapter one. Chapter one, the opening framing before we kind of get into the other thing is is the the thing that immediately we get the idea that the syndicate has been largely unaffected by the dimensional anomaly directly in that they lost comparatively few personnel. They operated almost entirely on earth side where with a quick aside that, that says that's where the money is. And I'm like, okay, that's good that you're, you're putting your cards on the table like that. The introduction, Production is to me a little bit internally jarring where they kind of say that the syndicate has made a world where if you work hard and play by the rules, you are guaranteed to succeed and you will benefit from it where I would define millennial dissatisfaction as the breaking of that promise where people did everything they thought they were supposed to. And then they emerged from college with $120,000 in debt and can barely get a minimum wage job, which means if true, this is another example of how the world of darkness is better than our world. And it kind of walks through what they consider to be the current state of things. Their goal is to harness new internet technologies, that there are new communication technologies which are making their job more complicated. For instance, they list the Occupy movement as an organization that wouldn't have been possible previously. We get the idea that the syndicate is kind of the accountants for the technocracy, which isn't exactly a surprise. But they also list that they are in charge of every finite resource, more or less, that is not personnel, that they keep track of rare materials and quintessence and other things like that, which I thought was interesting. I I just presumed that the syndicate was not in charge, for instance, of nodes. And then we get information later in the book that's like, nope, we we take care of those too. They have internal exchanges to keep those assets liquid. They also talk about how one of the major things that they do through disbursements, which we'll talk about later, is more or less investigate what different groups within the technocracy are doing and that they may take a accountant and send them out into field operations for three to six months. And kind of an adventure hook is you start going out to investigate why this group is consuming 30% more premium than is necessary. And suddenly you arrive and you need to be the frontline technocrat to deal with the werewolves or 
whomever that are that are harrying the group. This strikes me as being written in a time where the authors hadn't fully digested that was going on at the time. So it's one of those things where, to me, it accurately captures the mood of 2012 and 2013. But just because time has passed, you get just a, a slightly different view on things. So it is surprising to me that some of this stuff feels more dated than what had happened early on. They quickly establish the atom box on page 16, which says, hey, we have a new term for paradox too. And here they refer to it as market corrections. I wish they had given us an iteration X term because we didn't get one. So I'd be curious to see what that ultimately would be. And then we get into uh, the history section. We get a slightly revised and harmonized history of the group. They, They have this wonderful aside where they're like, we trace our ways back to ancient Rome. Everyone tries to, and here's our attempt at it, where they're just kind of putting their cards on the table. 715 BCE, the founding of the Brotherhood of the Rule occurs. They're a group of laborers and skilled workers. And then it very much fast forward almost two millennia. We get an aside that the Dark Ages were mostly dark in Europe, that the Ottomans, the Pala, and the pre-Mongol Asia was just doing fine. And they mentioned that at any time they bring that up, it makes uh, certain people slightly uncomfortable. In 997, Wolfgang von Riesman gathers everyone he could find together at the gathering of the square in Frankfurt. They found the company and are eventually known as the uh, the Craft Masons. They mention the character of Stephen Trevain, who is a guy who beat up nobles and stole their stuff when they tried to shut down his market, who eventually inspired Robin Hood. Uh, in retaliation, trade guilds are banned and the Craft Masons are stymied by the effect of Baldwin Langdestrat, who was a member of Mistridge. This happens in 1198. Uh, Trevain is backed by von Riesman, who assaults Wish Mistridge later, which means that the first attack on the traditions was led by Robin Hood. That is a little bit of mage lore that I hadn't completely had sunk in for me, where it's like, it was the first enemy of the traditions, Robin Hood. Okay. The syndicate tried to improve things during the Dark Ages, but mortals kept being happy and sufficing, and they became lazy, which eventually caused a philosophical rift between a group that thought that the immortals just need to be shepherded, and others who said, well, if we make things good enough for them, they will merely blossom into their ultimate form. One of the criticisms I do have of this book is that Syndicate 2E focused on how important consumerism was to drive desire and how important that was in molding what people want. Here, this book seems to take that a little bit as a given. We don't have that discussion of the uh, philosophical importance of consumerism to the syndicate and how they operate. Eventually, Trevain ultimately backs a group of British peasants. I think it was the Levelers or the Rounders. I can never quite remember which of those to redistribute property. And it's basically Trevain and these British peasants against everyone else. The Craft Masons are defeated and ultimately disbanded in 1649. In 1704, Reginald Proctor begins creating Proctor houses and lays out a vision for how an industrial revolution should occur. As that revolution occurs, many people turn to spiritualism, and in 1885, he turns to Queen Victoria and forms the Grand Council of World Government. The reorganization of the technocracy from the order of reason to the technocracy occurs in 1890. The text throughout sprinkles the idea that during times of downturns, uh, there are more extraordinary citizens that are formed, and that may be what has caused the current spike. The The idea that the 2008 financial crisis may have caused a dip in satisfaction, and that results in, in many more extraordinary citizens coming around. We, again, fast forward to the post-World War II idea that the syndicate is trying to make it acceptable to be rich, and that over a multiple decades, they try and rehabilitate wealth as something that is desirable, acceptable, and that should be praised. They take credit, or that is to say blame, for both Enron's collapse and the 2008 financial crisis, which was caused by what they say is they were asked to fund a lot of projects very quickly, and the best way they had to do that was by putting out a lot of financial instruments of dubious quality to collect the capital to to pass it on to other members of the technocratic union. That did not work well, eventually results in a mass market correction, and budgets wind up being cut across the board. So since they are the ones responsible for bringing in the money and handing it out to other people, 
other groups view them as responsible for their failure having caused this collapse, despite the fact that to them, the fact that everyone else was demanding so much kind of uh, fed into it initially. There's a brief aside about how they think the idea of the NWO's feed is idiotic, that they fundamentally don't understand social media, that they are trying to control the message, they being the, the feed methodology, whereas the syndicate is much more interested in curating people. It kind of flashes forward to the current state of play, which is to say they want to keep the masses happy. They want a happy consensus that can be easily directed. And then it reviews what they think of the other conventions. They consider the iterators to have gone unhinged since the computer went away. The NWO, they think that it made sense that when education and politics went hand in hand, that both be covered by a single group. But now that education is comparatively more egalitarian, that is no longer the case. And the progenitors, they're like, they're rock steady. They make cash. Anti-aging is part of our compensation package. Go progenitors. It also returns to something from the previous syndicate book of basically saying that the void engineers are a giant money sink. The tradition portion like the previous books, kind of takes a different tack. And rather just saying what they what their opinion is, they kind of just mention what thing they sell to try and co-op the different groups. For instance, one of the things they did was one of the easiest ways to disempower the verbena is with feminism. In a world where women are more on equal footing to men, the idea of a female-empowered mystery cult is less needed. And it goes through, this is how we co-opt shamanic beliefs that we're able to sell. And they talk about the ability to sell that through due to white guilt and the idea of embracing a noble culture by indigenous peoples. And it is quite simply nice to see that they lay out the tools and methodologies that they use to co-opt and subvert the other groups. They note that it is somewhat hard for them to sell atheism. So they are perfectly fine with the celestial chorus running around, assuming that they are able to monetize it. There is also an aside about a group called pre-correction a group that prevents people from tampering with the money supply. And this attempts to address the very obvious problem of with matter too, you can kind of make an arbitrary amount of money depending on how much paradox you ultimately want to have to deal with. And of the things in the book that I wish had more information about it, this is certainly near the top, what their effects look like, how they track it down, some of their enemies and so on. I, I would have been fascinated by that. They go over other night folk that syndicate agents may encounter and we get a reference to hunters yay but no references to mummy so take that mummy and that uh, draws it to the end of chapter one a relatively tight history section more information about their interactions with other enlightened and awakened groups and adam what do you think about it page 17 of state of technology uh, i think it's silly for the syndicate to say that they made the internet a shopping channel uh, when the internet started, young people and innovative people were on it. They talked about uh, interesting things. Now the general public is on it. And of course, they want to, uh, they don't want to discuss unusual things. They want to buy stuff and be entertained. I think it's just a, a natural result of the people on it. Um, I, I think saying that the syndicate pushed it to be a certain way, is, it just sounds ridiculous to me. But I saw a number of things in chapter one that really work to make the syndicate really, really elitist, uh, especially the sidebar on page 23. It has a very, very elitist voice. So I, I think the authors were consciously putting effort into make, turning the reader against the syndicate here. And I guess I can see some of that, but uh, at times I think it was a bit too much. Like page 26 at the top right, they say that, oh, patriotism is, is a tool we use to manipulate people. It's like, well, that is a really cynical view on patriotism. There was almost no shadow history in the history section, which I guess for a revised edition is pretty common. I, I guess I shouldn't complain about it, but uh, I saw such fun examples of it um, just a few books earlier. So I was kind of disappointed with, with the lack of shadow history. Uh, I saw how towards the end of the chapter, it says that there are a number of supernatural beings that the syndicate has decided they just don't believe in. And I guess a person could argue that that is in keeping with their perhaps paradigm and outlook on life. I take a more pragmatic view of, of mages. Mages live in a world where there are supernatural beings. And if they're going to you know, clap their hands over their ears and pretend they don't exist, it actually makes them look incompetent. So I, I don't really support that uh, take on things. But um, yeah, I'm ready for chapter two. Chapter two is entitled Human Resources. And 
it talks about what the makeup of the syndicate is. We get the providers, the unawakened at the low end of things. Their goal is to feed opportunities into the organization, and they can come from Fortune 500 companies, the heavily indebted but capable people with criminal backgrounds, any number of streams. New people start at the bottom very clearly, and they should have some degree of exploitability. Above them, you have ground-level associates, which are given a task or set of tasks, a vague idea of what the syndicate is, and a vaguer idea of what the technocratic union is. And it makes an interesting mention that it says the union is a cartel, where a cartel is a arrangement or group whose goal is to limit access to something. So this comes down to the idea that you could argue that the technocratic union is a cartel of ideas or technologies. Above the associates, you have managers, which arrange a portfolio of some sort. They are expected to build a little fief for themselves. And it says that this is very expected as it gives them something to fight for as they advance. You are always more invested in something where you have skin in the game. Above the managers, you have the chairs that head a large organization or network. They are still expected to grow their ventures. And this is the level where the real perks start. It mentions that the chairs are effectively immortal. Above them are the board of directors, which they mention, thanks to immortality treatments and the fact that they generally stay on Earth and are very well protected, will likely never change. Those board seats consist of energy, finance, healthcare, media, manufacturing, transportation, and resource extraction. And they mention that the VPO of finance is implicitly the most powerful person kind of within the syndicate, or at least those who report up through that chair are the most powerful. The other thing that is kind of interesting about this is we get names. It gives us the board as of 2013, where they are operating um, out of, and it then goes on to kind of how this organization is used. Theirs is a network of soft power that they operate through bribes and threats and f sheer financial inducements that personal business and syndicate business are often mixed. And it makes mention that what is the point of giving someone power if they don't have the opportunity to abuse it every once in a while for personal benefit? So uh, shot throughout is the idea that by mixing the technocracy's agenda with everyone's personal agenda, that they can maximize their output. That they, they kind of talk about the ideals of the group, that they don't have as many formal policies and procedures. They may have a charter or a list of operating procedures. But for instance, they talk about always be closing, that every syndicate member should be looking to maximize profits and income at all time, that we need to work towards the timetable, that you shouldn't steal or pirate from other groups. And it has this lovely little aside where it says, it's fine working with reality deviants, but don't steal things from other people because then you become the worst thing of all, a socialist. And just the absolute like sneering that it has as at that throughout the book, I, uh, I I very much enjoy. I found that that to be fun. That it is acceptable to consort with the enemy as long as you have a very good reason to do it. That you need to cover your ass. That the union is vast, and but that the masses in turn absolutely dwarf us. And finally, kind of this notion of generosity. That the syndicate is often in the position of saying no, but if you are capable of helping another technocrat with little cost that you should do it. If nothing else, it generates a lot of favors. This is one of the few cases where we get a peek into how they deal with disciplinary issues. That for small infractions, you may be passed up for a promotion. It is likely still recoverable. Uh, that assuming you are not knocked down a level, you should be okay. For larger infractions, you get bumped down again a level and it is likely that you will never really advance beyond that for the rest of your time and that the biggest problem that you could run into is treason and they mentioned that you need to be doing something so utterly brilliant that once it is revealed what you are doing you will be immediately promoted or once again my bros in the syndicate they will literally kill you and sell your organs so <laughs> they're like not only will you die but we are going to find a way to profit off of your remains the next section is Going through the methodologies. Hey, Adam, what are the methodologies in the syndicate? All right. The methodologies in the syndicate, uh, we start off with disbursements, handles funding for not only the convention, but the entire technocratic union. As a result, they can help or hinder projects and entire constructs. They started at the convention of the Ivory Tower as the Sun Guild. Reorganization under Queen Victoria made them little more than clerical support for the financiers, but years of work brought them the authority they enjoy today. The Assessment Division, approve or deny funding for new projects. The 
Reorganization Division evaluates troublesome projects or facilitates and advises on what needs to go. Procurements Division distributes resources to syndicate members from other conventions. Extraction Division oversees nodes and ventures from which they harvest primal energy. They are rumored to hide away some of their energy to trade for favors. Disbursements is the primary source of tension with the New World Order. Enforcers are the syndicate's muscle, persuasion, intimidation, and when needed, actual violence. In revised edition, this methodology has little influence in organized crime and has its members mostly in private security, law enforcement, and mercenary groups. During the Renaissance, the Resplendent Axe Company was a mercenary company helping merchants across the Silk Road, while the Rose Guild pursued court intrigue. Both groups worked for the High Guild and formed the nucleus of the enforcers. The Legal Division has uh, law enforcement, lawyers, and related roles. The Extra Legal Division has members in organized crime groups. Extra National Division has mercenaries and private security connections, along with influence in nation's defense departments. Inspectors are information specialists who carry out quiet break-ins, hacking, document recovery, etc. Many enforcers transfer to other methods that methodologies as they age. Financiers could be called the core of the convention. They guide the world's financial markets. They began in 1851 as a solution to simplifying the many and complicated agreements between guilds. The New World Order and Queen Victoria supported the idea. Acquisitions division generates funds in the business market by targeting existing companies. Entrepreneurship division uses venture capital and seeks to start new companies. Liquidation division extracts everything of value from troubled companies. Media control is the youngest methodology and the most glamorous. They work to push the convention's message in a variety of medias, including social media. Media control started out as a single amalgam at the 1851 Great Exhibition. They increased their staff until they were recognized as a methodology in 1909. The effects division handles traditional media. The spin division makes sure the proper messages are found in the news. Marketing division handles all manner of advertising. Media control fears the growing trend of people on the internet redistributing and altering the products of established media. Special Projects Division used to be a small and secretive methodology that worked closely with Pentex Corporation from Werewolf the Apocalypse fame. After the dimensional anomaly, SPD went completely silent. Syndicate investigators disappeared, but payments kept coming, so the syndicate decided to give it up. The Special Information Security Division pretends to be the Special Projects Division when other conventions make requests. The SISD also works hard to keep this secret from getting outside the syndicate. Uh, so just a good place to share my own thoughts on this part of Chapter 2. I don't like the revelation that disbursements funding decisions are the primary source of conflict with the New World Order. I see the underlying philosophies of the two conventions as being inherently at odds. Uh, I was sad to see organized crime de-emphasized for the enforcers. I always thought there was a lot of potential there. The divisions within the methodology seem like an unnecessary and, frankly, uninteresting complication. To be perfectly honest, after reading through the methodologies, I feel like these pages are devoted to making the syndicate look evil rather than helping us understand what they actually accomplished for the technocracy. Special Products Division's new status is supposed to be a big mystery that tempts the players, but it doesn't work for me. After the syndicate lost agents investigating it, they accepted payments from it and worked to keep other conventions from finding out. I don't believe they could keep it secret from the other conventions, and I don't think they would just stop investigating. It's going too far for me. The real point of this development is to make the syndicate look greedy to the readers. That came out to me again and again and again going through these methodologies. But uh, that wraps up my uh, thoughts on the methodologies. One, I very much like the idea that they talk about the power of NDAs, and that is when I suddenly realized that an NDA is just the technocratic version of a Gaius or a Geish. I like the suspension of the SPD mystery. It creates an idea that there is this kind of sprawling technocracy where what someone in the progenitors is doing would have no idea what this group over here is doing. And it kind of mirrors what we will eventually get to with the void engineers, that there is something secret that each convention needs needs to take care of. So in Iteration X, you have this budding machine cult. In the NWO, you kind of have this internal ivory tower war, which was kind of highlighted with the College of Gender Studies. Here you have SPD, and in the Void Engineers, you ultimately have Threat and All. So they have this big internal thing that they're trying to keep hidden. This kind of reminds me of the late second edition, early revised thing, where the Euthanatoi are like, hey, we're trying to quickly purge the Xerophi out from the traditions and we need to do it quietly, but it ultimately comes out that it's like, hey, we did this purge. The 
breakdown of the subgroups I liked, that, that we had not only the methodologies, but kind of the groups within the methodologies. And I think they were very good in that each of them kind of gave you a different way that the syndicate could interact with a group that like within disbursements, you have the assessment division, which is going to come out and, and appraise what you're doing. And then you have the reorganization division. If things go poorly, that says, hey, we need to liquidate out this. And then you finally have uh, procurement, which is going to handle goods and just the aside that like these people are very popular within the syndicate i thought it was i thought it was a bunch of useful stuff and shot through with the art of vincent Locke, who i generally like as an artist within the game it also explains that the syndicate owns less than one would assume in this little sidebar of owning versus consulting that the financiers generally serve as consultants so they can come and go as they please and this kind of answers the question of how public facing the syndicate actually is. How likely is someone to come face to face with an actual syndicate member? And I thought it helped elucidate what was going on in there. So Adam, what'd you think about the rest of the chapter? Page 48, the description of, quote, unfettered global markets, unquote, is really just crime and terrorism. And it didn't seem to be what free trade is to me. The author's biases make this a view into more of an alternate dimension, uh, I thought. Page 52, there's a sidebar saying newspapers have avoided media controls influence. And again, this seems not only unbelievable, but actually strange to me. The claim that newspaper reporters are virtuous chaps is, is silly. The idea that media control likes people getting their news from the internet is also uh, very hard to support for me. Uh, internet news is much, much harder to guide it in desired directions than newspapers, especially since newspapers these days get m the vast majority of their content from just two or three sources. So I thought it was very interesting to see the top leadership go from global regions to uh, seven industries. I, th I thought that made a lot of sense. Uh, I thought that was really cool to see. I think that is a good way to avoid waste. Uh, I, I think if you have a person who's focusing on, say, Southeast Asia or, or East Asia or something, they're, they're going to be doing things in a way that is going to probably pick one or two uh, key metrics and then ignore a lot of other things. But when you instead take the different key metrics and assign them out to different people, I think they're going to per be pursued much more efficiently. So that actually made a lot of sense to me. I really liked seeing that. It also mentions the general idea that the syndicate as a group is more practical in their efforts, in their thinking, than the New World Order is, which uh, it claims to be very idealistic. And I thought that that made a lot of sense. That, that really clicked with me. I, I think that is very helpful to storytellers approaching a technocracy in games. The New World Order has this vision for how the world ought to be, and it tries to shove everything into that mold. Whereas the syndicate is more practical. They basically look at what do we have here? How can we, how can we use that? How can we work in this environment uh, that we're learning about? So uh, I, I really liked that idea. Chapter three is global players and blowout deals. And it starts with key, three key personnel. The first one we get is Deep D. Palai, who is a character that is heavily involved in finance, has a reputation for unmitigated success. And it makes mention of her TED Talk, which gives us an example of a technocrat that is very well known in the public eye. We then get Vanessa Redface Shen, who is a member of the Enforcers, who replaced Simcoe, who was the leader of the Dyfbacher Casino that was presented in the 2E Syndicate book. And this is part of kind of just the turnover that occurs within uh, the additions. And then finally, we get Sir Harlan Svensson, which felt like a combination of Johnny Ive and maybe Richard Dyson. And I thought that was kind of interesting, the idea that he is the interface between the iterators and the syndicate and is somewhat public facing. And there are very few sleepers who have not touched a product that has been made by him, I presume within the developed world. I thought these were all perfectly fine. And it was less characters that you would introduce and more information about how the syndicate is seen in the sleeper world. Uh, the next section we get is legends and where historically legends have been things that may exist. This just seemed to be syndicate operations. For instance, they have the Godfathers, which is a group that's trying to reconcile the New World Order and the syndicate, where they create situations where the two groups have to come together in wacky a Abbott and Costello action comedy scenarios, seemingly, where they fund traditionalists to steal things, to force NWO law enforcement and syndicate money trackers to 
figure out what happened. There was an investigation of the flash crash, which was a kind of a blip that occurred in May of 2010, where an algorithm placed a $4.1 billion trade that very rapidly caused mass movement within a number of markets as algorithmic trading regimes interacted with one another and kind of went went crazy. They mentioned that while the restart of the market took about five minutes, in subjective time, it took about three hours. And the backlash involved in that effect uh, killed many syndicate members. And the question here is, who did it? I do like the idea that weird coincidences in our world were actually just a slight tipping of the hand for much more involved procedures that were done or much more involved magic effects that were done by some group within Mage. I think that's a that's kind of a neat idea. Then they talk about uh, Juice, which just seems to be the syndicate's version of clout. It is a attempt at coming up with a personal credit score, more or less, a way of gauging influence and it's like uh, this is the the true measure of worth and so on it then goes on to macroeconomic fronts where it talks about what is happening around the world and it mentions that hey in africa most of our ages here are african we consider that an improvement i'm like Good on you, Syndicate. They make a a mention, and this is something that is kind of recurring in the book, where they talk about more or less the shortcomings of pursuing the efficient market, where it says, we don't really worry about tyrants because markets punish isolation and, and with it tyranny. And it's one of those things where I'm like, yes, I very much see why you believe it that way, but it is remarkable how persistent tyranny can be in the face of market forces. They talk about how in the Middle East, there is a concern about how they can safely transition to nuclear power and be rid of fossil fuels, which are the only things keeping the uh, the area's markets up and running. That in North America, they're not quite sure what to do next. And there is a suggestion that they may try and retire the U.S. as the sole global superpower in Asia, that the 90s financial crisis was engineered, that they believe that prosperity would precede democracy. And I'm like, "Mm, you seem to have missed on that one. And they also suggest that there is another hyper economic faction working within the area. In Europe, they're like colonialism created a world of entitlement. It is riddled with secret societies and wasted resources. And I'm like, take that Europe. And then it talks about the Pacific and it's like, yeah, islands are really hard to deal with. So, uh, Iterators, could we get on that beamed power that we were supposed to have by now? It then talks about the type of amalgams that the syndicate has, and it makes a differentiation between uh, crews and teams, that crews are hierarchical while teams tend to be more egalitarian, that you have executive amalgams that report to the board, you have commanded an amalgams that fine-tune the orders they receive, and then working amalgams that do what they are told. That within a large organization, a amalgam may be departmental, it may cover a particular aspect of operation for a very large form, or it may be the enterprise itself that runs a front. And it's like, hey, who doesn't want to role play a small business owner? I'm like, okay. It talks about how you can take real world things and introduce them into your game, that it may be useful to come up with job descriptions, as that is often what is in the syndicate that it is useful to have a mission statement for a given front or operation and come up with an employee handbook and that you can look through real world resources to see what those should look with. At some points that they will come up with task force and cross division amalgams that most tend to work across methodologies and that task forces tend to be short lived and uh, tend to do something somewhat specific. They then go on to Pax Corp, which is a organization that has kind of acts as a patent troll, that it collects intellectual patent and is used as a front, that it is a collection of lawyers that is used to harry the awakened, that they have a staff of between five and 10 enlightened associates, their personal staff, and some additional agents. Uh, the thing I liked here is it includes the pooled backgrounds for the members of the group. So not only what individual members have, but what they have collective access to that they have resources for due to license fees, that they have access to Spies 3, and that consists of various traditionalist and rogue technocrat fronts. I appreciated that. We then get the character of Thor Vestergaard, who is a managing partner, who talks about basically how he went through armed forces training, was deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, and is continually finding himself being pulled back into the world of being able to deliver violence, partially because as a uh, six foot three Danish man, I think it is kind of what people expect. And this contains my single favorite listing of resonances in Revised, where it says he has resonance of windswept, dynamic, and cadenced, static. So I am fascinated. I want to know what windswept 
residence looks like. Um, so, but just the idea that uh, much like when we were talking about the NWO, that it was a group that didn't necessarily shoot traditionalists, but kind of made their life difficult. This Pax Corp does something similar, that they're a collection of lawyers that harry and bother their enemies in the Ascension War. The next section is entitled Extraordinary Products, Enlightened Services, and uh, this, is, this is the magic section. When they want to do a procedure, they're often depending on having a particular item or process to do it. They, as a group, want to show that people succeed and fail on their merits, which requires them to show excellence. So the idea being, if people are self-made and we are doing better than everyone else, we need to show that that is either due to personal drive or the accoutrement that we have. So the constant kind of arrogance and elitism, it is one of those things where they claim that they're on top because they're better than everyone else, but it could also be the other way around. They happen to be the people on top, and from that, they presume that they have to be better than everyone else. And that is uh, something that, that also kind of recurs through it. And it's one of those things where you're like, well, they're literally mages. They're certainly better in a lot of ways in terms of capacity than than mere mortals. So there is some evidence for it, but how, how do we feel in a game about having more or less the enlightened 1%? It talks about how, through their paradigm, that often their magical effects are enabled by in infrastructure. These are firms that exist within the syndicate that provide uh, certain services. And there's a little sidebar where it talks about, for instance, Iridium Medical or Mercury Logistics or Plexic, which felt like some sort of combination of uh, of Google and kind of Amazon's web services and so on, among other things with maybe like an L3 kind of firm to it. And just kind of the very delicate dance of how unmagical a lot of their magic looks that the magic comes in the fact that it is not magical to have a cell phone that works it is magical to have a cell phone that works everywhere always it is not magical to have rapid delivery it is magical to have that delivery be able to work within two hours anywhere on the face of the planet so this is one of those things where if you want your magic to be obvious you may have difficulty with how the syndicate is presented here this is one of those things where it's kind of a departure from what we've seen in mage before so i would have liked a little bit more information they talk about how to use money as an apparatus which is to say as a focus that it is the resources background like represents capability and that is again something that i would have liked a little bit more uh, information on how they do that and then we get into the roots and so on for instance downvote gives you the the ability to give data arcane that you have the ability to hide information it is kind of interesting that that is a correspondence entropy effect it feels like it should be data as an aside it's like yeah they could use the data sphere but we're not really going to to mention it at all so it would have been nice to see a little bit more reinforcing there but i understand when they're like hey we want to be able to write this such that it is if you don't have that previous book things are fine forecast introduce an interesting mechanic where you can roll for a action you will likely do ahead of time and choose to use at the time that that comes up in your session, choose to use your forecasted roll or choose to uh, roll again. I would be curious to see if that's one of those things where the authors intend that you'd be able to use modifiers in that controlled circumstance when you're running through the simulation of cracking down the door or the negotiations or what have you. That is an interesting mechanic. It kind of comes out of nowhere and I'm always thrown off when rotes are like, hi, this mechanic is does not emerge organically from what is previously listed as being part of the spheres. But regardless, I think it's kind of interesting. You have workflow, which is something that allows people to to work faster, possibly to, to severe personal and deleterious effect. And it also talks about the difference between extraordinary devices and apparatuses. So it talks about more or less what is the difference between a focus and a, a wonder. And it's like, hey, the focus version is always going to have some bit of quirkiness to it. It is not necessarily going to work 100% of the time. That's fine, but we do not get a mechanical representation of that. And if it doesn't exist in the mechanics, I don't quite believe it. It then goes through a whole bunch of goodies that are made possible by the various firms that the syndicate has produced and how they function differently in the hands of the enlightened technocrat. And Kind of one of my favorite ones here is the EDG Virtuous Executive Smartphone. And they talk about how in 2013, it is this roughly $100,000 smartphone and that it is the, the height of power. But within the syndicate, 
it is uh, considered a black mark because one of the notes about it is it contains a software package which makes it trivial to trace. So if you're assigned one of these phones, it is one, a generation of technology behind, and two, it means that you're being tracked. So it is kind of a puck against you. And I thought that was interesting that this $100,000 cell phone is used to kind of uh, snub someone. The next section is called hyper-economics and primal utility. And this is an attempt to explain how the primal utility sphere works. It says that money and quintessence are more or less interchangeable in that they both measure possibility and capacity. And this is part of the reason why I consider the syndicate to be kind of the most mystical of the technocratic groups possibly. And it says that primal utility is the access to pure utility, that they don't attempt to define quintessence. They just note that it has these properties. It also mentions that superstitionists collect and hoard it rather than creating it. And then it goes through kind of an extended system to explain how economic ventures can be used as nodes that being at the top of a global crime syndicate and being able to harness the energy and willpower of thought of the people participating in it is just as valid a way to retrieve quintessence as meditating at a node. And much like the data sphere, we get a chart that says, hey, this is how big the venture is, this is the equivalent node rating, and this is the required connection to extract from it. So the idea is that the larger the primal venture that you want to tap, the more in tune with its operations you need to be. Where for a five dot primal venture, you need to be a member of the board of directors, or you need to have a five dot investment in the group, or you need to be its executive. And that as your primal utility rating rises, you need less and less of a connection to it to tap it. This is kind of an interesting idea. It doesn't give us a good idea of what kind of that internal war looks like. So if, for instance, you have a relatively high rating and you only need to have a relationship via a stockholder meeting or visit a facility or something like that, how does the syndicate manage that internally? I would have liked a little bit of information on that. We also get the different dot effects for the sphere, which in some cases are quite different. And it basically talks about how, yes, it is easier for them to make devices because devices are very core to their experience, which now puts us in the position of the syndicate seemingly being the major producer of wonders within the technocracy, which partially makes sense because it suggests a lot of their effects are not done by them, but by them overseeing a staff. But that is kind of a, uh, a departure from what I expected because I always presumed that a lot of these things were probably done by iterators or progenitors or what have you. In a lot of cases, it allows you to mirror what is being done with Prime 2, assuming that you are willing to kind of somewhat restrict what you are doing to things that fit within this kind of economic paradigm. It also notes that primal ventures shouldn't be boring. They can't just be something that generates money, but in some way needs to require harness the human drive. The last thing in the section are a number of character sheets. And I thought all of the character sheets were, were more or less fine. And I thought I would probably never use these as character templates, but I think they are a good source of NPCs or people that may be a member of the syndicate that you first wouldn't anticipate. There's kind of this mystery investigative figure in the form of Miss J. We get the global microfinance mogul, a, a mercenary, a soldier of war, a gambler, and more or less a internet. And that brings us to the end of chapter three. Adam, what did you think about Medic? Chapter three was a big one. So yeah, there big are book. a number of things uh, to cover here. Let's see, uh, movers and shakers section. I Honestly, I found it to be uh, quite dull. I, I just found nothing of value in there. I, I like the fact that there were two pages of legends, but unfortunately there was only only one good one in there. The, uh, what is it, uh, the flash crash uh, of the um, industrial market. I, I thought that was pretty cool. But page 64, a quote, media control reinforces the old colonial biases to maintain a paternalistic perspective, end quote. Man, anything to make the syndicate look bad. Page 65, the elemental dragons had their wings clipped. I was so amazed to see that. I'm not saying that I love it or hate it. I, it just really surprised me. It's like uh, the, the authors of this book took a baseball bat to the elemental dragons, the uh, East Asian technocracy. Um, that That is a, a major shakeup uh, fit down into uh, just a, a very small number of sentences. So when I saw that, I kind of expected to see more about that since it's such a, a big change in the global technocracy. But uh, no, they, they just sort of mentioned it in passing and moved on. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, did, did people not like the elemental dragons or do the authors not like them? Or Let's see, macroeconomic fronts. Uh, this gives us opinions on sleeper politics, but I really wanted to know what the syndicate is 
doing in the world. If the syndicate is so practical, why all this idealistic commentary? That that just struck me as, as an odd section of chapter three. Uh, page 66, uh, technocrats sacrificed individual aims to serve a higher purpose, a notion that annoys enlightened capitalists, end quote. Why would that annoy capitalists? The authors have a very different definition of the word capitalist than I do, I guess. I would probably have to talk to a lot of people to see this different perspective on capitalist to even understand that passage. Syndicate amalgams. I saw this as academic, not practical. Uh, this this section of uh, chapter three should have either given us systems for making desk work interesting or advice on how to get players uh, more active and away from their desk. But instead, it was just sort of academic notions about the syndicate in general. I thought the sample amalgam was actually pretty good. I thought it was flexible and it was a nice use of uh, technocracy background. So I, I was... I would probably use the, that sample amalgam in, in some of my games. The Extraordinary Devices, uh, this section is about making vulgar effects coincidental. So this, this actually pushes closer to the first edition view of technocrats than I would expect to see in a revised edition book. Although it says uh, allowing this expertise only after skill level four kind of pushes it up to a higher level, makes it more inaccessible. Uh, perhaps they thought that was balancing it. I, I thought that was rather odd, but um, then I, I guess I have more of a first edition way of looking at things. For the rotes, they have one called Hidden Features, and I thought this was too complicated, and it's how coincidental magic works anyways. So I, I would cut that right out. It, it seemed like more of a misunderstanding to me. There's one hyper-narrative influence, which is basically you start spouting cliches and that makes uh, the, peop the sleepers around you uh, think the way that you want them to think or they accept what it is you're doing. Again, I just thought that was so dopey. Uh, yes, people repeat cliches because they're, they're funny. You can get a laugh, but people don't actually believe these hackneyed cliches. So you know, working that into a mind effect, I think, is just very silly. Um, there's a section on guns, and I thought that was actually pretty useful. I um, thought that was a neat addition to uh, some of the techno technocracy weapons sections we've had in these other convention books. And when it came to templates at the... Or NPC templates, I guess, at the end of the section. I really liked the template for Mrs. J. Uh, she calls herself Mrs. J because she gives a, a different name for all the different people she works with, but every name starts with the letter J. So people, some people in the syndicate take to calling her Mrs. J. But her job is basically to foster relationships with tradition mages and orphans and then hire them with either actual money or uh, perhaps tasks to perform odd jobs, uh, run on missions, some of them dangerous, some of them not so much. This is great because after a mission is completed, um, if it turns out to be the wrong mission or it went really poorly, there's so much deniability. The syndicate can say, hey, these guys aren't us, so why are you looking at us? We had nothing to do with this one. Um, I thought that was actually a really cool idea, and it emphasized the notion earlier in the book that the syndicate is the practical convention in the technocracy. This is a, a very practical thing to do, and it opens up a lot of cool um, story ideas, I think. So I was really impressed with that one. And of course, this chapter had its section on primal utility and hyper-economics. Um, I noted that in this book, they use the term hyper-economics a lot, but in Mage 20, where this idea continues, they tend to call it primal utility and not hyper-economics. I just wanted to give my perspective on this because this was a, a very much a new idea. This was a departure from things we've seen in the past. This is a justification for changing the specialty sphere for this convention, which is another thing worth mentioning. Probably not so surprising to the listeners, uh, primarily utility doesn't appeal so much to me. Uh, I can see why they appeal to major revised fans. They fit in with revised edition. Revised edition greatly reduces the emphasis on the supernatural uh, spirits, the umbra, supernatural forces, and occurrences in the world almost fade away in revised edition. It focuses on struggles between humans and regular human society. Mystic places, nodes, and ley lines are about supernatural energy. Hyper-economics is about business, financial transactions, criminal operations, music concerts. It's about things regular people do. Hyper-economics facilitates focusing on human society rather than anything magical. 
Also, hyper-economics depends on revised editions resonance rules. I use resonance in my games, but I don't use revised editions take on it because the supernatural is de-emphasized, saying that quintessence is money and vice versa kind of works in revised edition. Revised edition pushes mages and sleepers closer together, so saying what sleepers value is the same thing mages value becomes natural. Another point is the notion of magic. Many people slip into thinking magic is a kind of metaphor for value or worth or, or just power. People and their relationships have meaning and value, so does it follow that things people value have a magic all their own? Yeah, I'm putting the word magic in quotation marks here. I don't agree with this notion. In my games, magic is not a metaphor for meaning or value. It is supernatural energy and power. Sleepers aren't magical. You don't go to them when you want quintessence. Another thing to mention here, back in first edition, Bricado wanted to switch away from fighting over nodes, so he introduced the idea that quintessence can be found from other sources. However, this wasn't very well supported. The technocrats sucked quintessence out of hapless sleepers and captured mages, while the tradition mages... Well, I don't remember examples of tradition mages getting quintessence from alternate sources other than a brief mention of some mages finding quintessence floating in the deep umbra, which is not a place many mages visit. Hyper-economics gives mages a way to get quintessence without getting it from nodes. If you want to get away from having mages fight over nodes all the time, this is a step towards that goal. However, I think there are better ways to handle it. I think quintessence really is magic energy, thus it should come from magical sources, uh, not sleepers doing regular sleeper things. I don't think you can pull quintessence out of a stack of $100 bills or a large corporate bank account. I don't think you can drain tasks and turn it into dollars in a bank account. Making that change has repercussions for my mage setting that can cause problems. Now, I can hear the dissenters, but Adam, it isn't saying money and quintessence are literally the same thing. They're both abstracted out to the level of systems of value. At that level of abstractions, they're basically the same thing and can be conflated. It's about paradigm. I still can't play along. What I liked about Stuart Wick's vision of mage was different paradigms granted different advantages and disadvantages. But when a paradigm or discovery got too far removed from reality, not consensus, but true reality, Paradox would slap it down. Magic energy and human economic systems just aren't the same thing. Mages who want to combine them are going to get a rude awakening from the universe uh, they live in. And I think mages and sleepers are different. I like them valuing different things. Money is valuable to sleepers. Quintessence is valuable to mages. The two kinds of people live different lives because they are pursuing different things. I also have to admit, I don't like the balkanization of the sphere system. Uh, Stuart Wick's vision was every mage is doing uh, is using the same power without realizing it. As they increase their arete, they grow closer together in their understanding of magic. That's why they uh, join the oracles and leave their traditions, because uh, all of a sudden, uh, Euthanatos and uh, syndicate members who were both working with the ent entropy sphere uh, decide they have a lot more in common. And so they walk away from their former groups and they form this new group. A revised edition seems to advance the idea that the sphere system is just game rules. In the world of darkness, different groups of mages really are using different magic. This means they don't come together in the end. Their different ideas of magic are all correct for them. They will always be separated. For me, this is kind of a downer, but that's just me. Uh, finally, let me mention details. Hyper-economics is a slow way to work with quintessence. If a syndicate mages are NPCs pulling strings in the background, that's fine. If they are player characters that need to react to opponents, that's tough. The required connections to primal ventures in the table listed here, I think are, they're just too easy. You just need to shop there or attend a shareholder meeting to pull quintessence out of it. These rules make it too easy to become energy vampires that get quintessence by killing people. We need to think about the ramifications of certain rules on our mage chronicles. This would have technocrats killing people left and right when they need some juice. Finally, the rote economic warfare has mages using Prime 4 to make other people poor. Just my opinion, but it sounds dumb to me. To me, Prime is about magic energy, not about bank accounts. So, yeah, that's my view. Granted, I am a Mage Classic fan, so I don't expect other people to agree with it, but um, just I'm thankful that I have a chance to share my views. Next up, we have the epilogue, Buyer's Remorse, where a person realizes the bartender's wife is dying of cancer, which she just cut off the funding to, but here's some money. And then we get a, uh, a four-page character sheet. Into overall thoughts on the book, quite simply, this is one of my favorite revised books, and this is quite simply one of my favorite mage books to ever do. The fact that Adam and I have wildly different views on hyper-economics, its role on the table, and we are both playing mage, to me, points out how big a tent mage is as pertains to this notion of magic, I very much like that it, this book elucidates a 
a very subtle notion of magic, that not all magic is fantastic, that we do have this beltway that goes from impossible to vulgar to coincidental to mundane. And this shows a lot of magic that is on that border between coincidental and mundane. A lot of times we talk about things that are between coincidental and vulgar, and I appreciate that this says this is a group whose paradigm has so thoroughly infiltrated reality that at some point this will not even be magic, which requires a table to kind of have a notion of what is magic. Are there mundane activities that are magical? In some versions of Mage, the answer is yes, where in other cases there is a clear dichotomy between what is magical and what is non-magical. And this, in a lot of cases, very much blurs that. For instance, the Void Engineers aren't necessarily magical for the fact that they launch something into space, but the fact that they can do it thousands of times without issue and it raises the question of they go through a safety procedure beforehand. To them, that is a entropy to procedure to ensure good luck to mortalize that looks exceptionally normal. And to me, that is another type of magic that is on that mundane coincidental borderland. And it is up to a group to say, hey, what do we want to view that kind of thing as? Do we want to have the exchange of value to be a magical act unto itself? This book very much says at the end of the day, yes, where other people are like, no, this is not the fantastic aspect of Mage that I, I, I want to have there. This book very much advances that the syndicate are idealists, and it explains why. They harness the desire for a the mortal push to have stake in things. I like the idea of hyper-economics as an idea, and it says, it does kind of the werewolf thing, where it says, we work in the medium of utility and desire, and while mortals manipulate it indirectly, we can do so directly. We get to go to the heart of the matter. It elucidates how the war between the NWO and the syndicate comes about in, in, in kind of practicalities, where it says, yes, the NWO sets the agenda, but we determine what is funded, and that determines what ultimately gets to be done. That tension is very clear. The death of the three syndicate mages at the hand of the NWO uh, is, is brought back to the fore. To keep it straight, for me, hyper-economics is the paradigm element where primal utility is the sphere. So to me, hyper-economics is, is a paradigm and a focus where primal utility is a sphere. I am a big fan of, uh, of primal utility as an idea, and again, Victor Kinzer and I, because if it involves the syndicate, it involves Victor Kinzer and I, uh, discuss that at, at some length. I will include a link in the show notes. The, this idea, there's also a throwaway line that says, hey, there are other type of ventures that are not fundamentally economic that you can use. The NWO may have some with academic groups, and I think this is something that Mage could use everywhere that I think it makes perfect sense that even outside of the cult background, that mages should be able to accumulate a group of mortals that are doing something similar, and that should become an instrument of some sort. And that collective group is something that, that you can pull quintessence out of. I think you should have the ability to have a primal community event, that if there's a community group or a church or something that your characters are investing time and effort into, that that is something they would literally be able to pull quintessence out of. We get an idea of how the disbursements pushes people towards commercial successful projects and this book kind of answers like the key question that says like being a technocrat is really expensive that yes they have vast resources but almost all those resources are spoken for and it explains how you can have a very rich very powerful group that at the same time is trying to be wise about its money use. And it's one of those things where you have something like Orbital Maynar, which is something I consistently have a problem with. And to me, Orbital Maynar, where you can detect magic around the world, becomes much more feasible if you say, yes, we can run this, but running this effect literally costs us $2 billion. <laughs> and, and that, to me, puts into sharp focus what the limitations and what the drives within the technocracy are. A table may not want to account do that level of accounting, but that kind of explanation of saying, yes, they are widely capable, they just can't do everything at once, uh, makes sense to me. I like the idea that they make the SPD mystery deeper in this book, and we have the group that is kind of covering for them in the meantime. What the book has to do is give a lot of plot hooks for characters, and a lot of those 
as opposed to focusing on interactions with the outside world, talk about how syndicate games may be disproportionately likely to be games where they are investigating the actions of other technocrats, almost as if they're kind of an internal affairs-like group. And I I very much like that. Again, this is a book that was in my wheelhouse. If someone doesn't like it, that's perfectly fine. There are a bunch of different versions of Mage, and this happens to fit very clearly with a version that I, I, I very much enjoy. This is something I go to regularly, and uh, syndicate agents are almost always welcome at my table, at least in terms of player characters. I don't want them to be the actual players. That would cause problems on on a number of levels. Do you have any overall thoughts, Adam? As I was reading through this book, I was thinking about the problem of uh, syndicate enforcers versus vampires. I guess this book kind of skirted the issue because it said that the uh, enforcers are not so much in organized crime and they're more in law enforcement, uh, mercenaries, private security, etc. In the past, the enforcers were certainly more involved in organized crime. And uh, for me, I see some kind of a conflict there because vampires are also very involved in organized crime. So it seems like we enforcers would be encountering vampires a lot. They would be forced to be very aware of them and how to deal with them. Someone might say, oh, well, enforcers would have an impol- a policy of, you know, vampires are bad, leave leave their crime groups alone and make your own. It's like, well, that doesn't work very well because the vampires in organized crime are going to get their mitts into every group they can. So even if the enforcers are trying to avoid them, the vampires are going to come after whatever crime group the enforcers are involved with. So again, in my view of the setting for Mage, uh, the enforcers would need to be aware of vampires and be they must have policies in place for how to deal with them, specific rotes uh, that they work with, because this conflict is, is just going to be there. So some sort of resolution needs to be thought out if you're going to have stories or player characters that are involved with the enforcers. The idea that technocrats really need funds is uh, emphasized in revised edition. In first edition, mages had no trouble using magic to get sleeper resources. So uh, that is a big difference between mage classic and mage modern. Looking at the technocracy up to before this book came out, there was no convention in the technocracy that was closely linked with the prime sphere. Uh, it, it was just sort of assumed that they all had some knowledge in it. And since the Void Engineers dealt with sanitizing and capturing nodes, they, they must be a little better at Prime than other people. But Dimensional Science, or Spirit Sphere, was their main focus. And, and that made sense. In this book, they wanted to play with this idea of hyper-economics. And so they changed the specialty sphere of the Syndicate from Entropy Sphere and the probability side of the entropy sphere, not the decay side, which is the euthanatos. But uh, they changed that over from entropy to prime to support this this notion of hyper-economics in the book. And for some people, that that's a lot of fun. They want to run with that ball. For me, I, I look at the financiers and I see that entropy is just naturally a part of what they're going to do. And in fact, for me, the probability side of the entropy sphere is so closely connected with the underlying philosophies of this convention that I, I actually don't like to separate them away from the uh, entropy specialty sphere. But uh, it's just my take on it. As a mage fan reading through this book, the big question to me is, can you spend money to get quintessence. That is a really, really big issue for me, the way that I look at things. And that is because they talk in this book about other uh, valuable assets like uh, gemstones, um, valuable minerals, uh, real estate, etc. But all of those things have monetary value. So really, it's it's money that in the real world we focus on when talking about financial matters. And you know that makes sense. I can see that. But in the world of mage, If you can spend money to get more quintessence, then yes, it it makes sense to have money be the the, the central uh, resource that you watch that kind of is an umbrella over every other kind of resource. But in the first two editions of Mage, you spending money does not get you more quintessence. Quintessence comes up at nodes and uh, one all you have to do is basically meditate at the node and you can pull in some quintessence. You don't need to hire people to do work to get the quintessence for you. You don't need to buy equipment or materials to get at that quintessence. You just sit there and soak it up. Or it's Taz. You can put it in your pocket, uh, You know, walk to the other side of town, hand it to somebody, and they just soak it out of there. So in the first two editions of Mage, you 
you can't spend money to get any more quintessence than you could by not spending any money. So that is a question that storytellers are going to need to address. Uh, if It looks like in revised edition, equipment and personnel are required to get either quintessence at all or to get more of it or to get it more efficiently. And so if you can spend money to get quintessence, then a lot of this a lot of the things in this book will, will click for me, and I will agree. Yeah, that, that makes sense for me. But uh, yeah, the first two editions, you spending money doesn't get you any more quintessence. So uh, I just wanted to, to bring out that, that notion. This was not my favorite look at the syndicate. I was not a big fan of the first syndicate book. Uh, this book was quite different from the first, but again, I'm, I think there's a lot of interesting concepts behind the syndicate that I would really like to explore, and um, I, I don't see this book even having any awareness of them. Back in the mid '90s, the White Wolf uh, higher ups decided, "Hey, we we want to we're going to have to write some books on religious issues, not only for mage but also for for vampire. We're not the people to do that." So they looked for someone outside of White Wolf, and they found James Estes. He, he's a guy who can write game books, and he can talk about uh, religion and and approach that with a mature perspective. I think it worked out great. He put out books on uh, Inquisition, Celestial Chorus, a few others, and I think they were great books. Here, Onyx Path, I think they should have realized we're probably not the right people to be writing about the syndicate. We don't like capitalism. We're really not crazy about big business. But they didn't go looking for anyone outside. They just said, yeah, we'll be fine. And they did it themselves. And in my opinion, the book suffered for it. Um, I, I think they should have followed that model of uh, White Wolf from the mid-90s and say, hey, look, we're not going to handle this as well as someone who, who is really good on this topic. Let's go find somebody. Now that we've come to the end of the episode, I had a few story ideas uh, I just uh, wanted to have a chance to share with everybody. Number one, the flash crash of May 2010 remains a concern to financiers. Only false alarms have occurred until now. A careful set of financial transactions have created a cascading disaster in world markets that technocrat specialists are holding in temporal stasis. While they rush to find the best way to resolve the damage, the players are tasked with finding the culprits. The trail leads to a set of AI systems in the digital web calling themselves the Sons of Blue Meanie. But these AIs had communications with identities traced to secret agent John Courage. Is John Courage a red herring, or is he trying to fool the syndicate into revealing more secrets? The players will have to move carefully, but quickly. The financial disaster can't be frozen much longer, and when markets resume, the clues will vanish. The players will need a combination of financial skills, digital web navigation, and good old-fashioned espionage savvy if they want to catch the saboteur without making things worse. Number two. A favor is called in and the players agree to help the enforcers after one of theirs goes missing. Prominent crime figures in the city have a new secretary or girlfriend with gorgeous looks but dead blank eyes. After getting too close to one of these ladies, a conflict ensues and the players upset the head of the local technocrat symposium. Branded troublemakers, the players cannot request help, funds, or equipment until they can clear their names. With signs of both vampire and Nefandi involvement, this won't be an easy assignment, and the players will have to do it with nothing more than the Journal of the Missing Enforcer and some gumption. The journal gives the tricks of the Enforcer trade, and the players will need them. This story shows the rougher side of the Syndicate and may help your players discover what they can accomplish on their own. Number three, the Syndicate's practice of hiring tradition mages and orphans for special tasks has proved far more successful than anyone hoped. As the program increases personnel and funding, the players learn it's been infiltrated. The Euthanatos have been disguising their best and brightest and in the process have learned much about the Syndicate. However, the players learn the Euthanatos are focusing their attention on the Special Project Division rather than other parts of the Syndicate. Specifically, there is a nearby SPD facility that the Tradition Mages are close to discovering. The SPD deny the players' attempts to help so firmly that something appears to be wrong. What's going on at that warehouse complex? Are the players prepared to stand against a raid by the Death Mages? Does the bigger threat lie with the convention's enemies or its own members? So that wraps up a few story ideas I was hoping might uh, inspire uh, those listening to use the Syndicate in their own games. As we come to the end of an episode, Terry, do you have one of those great quotes for us? I have two quotes and then a question. My first quote is, we even fight to keep this world safe from our fellow enlightened, who in their zeal to see a world of hyper-technology forget the entire point of the technocracy, to keep this a world of the masses. And I thought that was a very useful kind of focusing thing. In previous books, we talked about the dichotomy between the utopians and the unionists, the group that's like, we want to further human aims as much as possible. And other people are like, we want to be in control. And this is going to be like, 
We want to be in control to keep everyone safe. Don't everyone keep your eyes on the darn ball. And the other one from the history section, uh, we get this bit of character arc that shows this bald woman of uh, that appears to be uh, quite dark skinned and who we find out is kind of our narrator throughout the book or at least that section. And it says, let's go back to our history. Western civilization loves ancient Rome. Why not? We start there too. The syndicate, I mean, I'm a woman from Ghana. That's pretty far from Roman pedigree. And I appreciated that, that tongue-in-cheek reference and being like, I don't draw back. I draw from completely different place. And and my question to you is, did you consider any of this book to be satire? Because I think one of the things that is interesting is revised in most cases very much – played things for face value, where second edition tended to have a bit more satire. And a lot of this book, I think, can be viewed as either cynical or a return to a little bit of tongue-in-cheek satire, which I think we also got with some of the ridiculousness in the progenitor book. Do you feel that this book had more or less satire, I guess you could say, than than most of the other revised book? I, I don't know. I, I get the feeling that the authors are hiding behind the pretense of satire so they can get in the zingers they want to. Got it. Cool. Okay. Uh, so what are we reading next, Adam? Uh, next up, we have the final book, the the true final book for all of Revised Edition, and that is Void Engineers uh, Revised. So that will be the final convention book and the final book in this edition. You want to take us out? Uh, yeah. If you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a positive review for Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in other people's searches, and we would certainly appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there, see the order in which they were released, and see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. A lot of handy links in there. This episode is thanks to executive producers. Just a note on this one that Patreon has had a little bit of a processing hiccup in the last few days that is being worked out. That's some sort of internet infrastructure issue. It's it's a well-known thing. So if you don't hear your name, just remember we record these ahead of time. Um, But if you don't hear it, by all means, poke us if we somehow forgot. This episode is brought to you by executive producers, Alex, Anon, Andrews S, Andrew Edelstein, Andy, Birdo, Boo, Buggers to the Sixth, Brad of the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris Zack, Dan Svensson, Dennis Osborne, Freddie, Gargle Noir, Guy Conan Stewart, Isabel Castillo, Jason Kennedy, J- Jason W. Biggs, Jeff Bryn, Jenna F., John H., John M., John G., Josh G., Josh H., Josh, other Josh H., Carl Halperin, LaBull, Leslie Weatherstone, Lexa Conjurer, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick Mulder, Ralph Scheinhammer, Richard Bat Brewster, Ryan Hilton, Ryan Kennedy, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, St. Bertie, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, and W. Starter. And a special thanks to our three Oracle level supporters, Jay Widener, Christopher Phillips, and Buck Farmer. Thank you, everyone, for your support. If you would like to become an executive producer for Made the Podcast, it would help us keep producing episodes like this one. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks everyone for listening. And until next time, truth until paradox, baby. One more! One! We have one more! (laughs) In revised, and then we cover several other editions, time permitting. Bye!